Chapter 7 Big Me, Little King It was time to go. God had made that clear to me. I'd been serving faithfully as a youth pastor at a wonderful church. I considered the pastor a father figure to me. But I had a rude awakening when I sat down with him to share that I felt like God was calling me into something new. This something new required traveling and was a way to do ministry in a different, creative way, a way that existed outside of the four walls of the traditional church. He was not happy. This leader, who I respected and admired very much, said to me, I don't believe that this thing you are trying to do is the voice of the Lord, and you know if I pray about it, this whole thing will fall apart. That hurt so bad. I'd served in that ministry devotedly. I'd honored him every chance I could. I desperately wanted to be looked upon as a son by him. So to hear someone you love say that they would pray against you and your dreams will fall apart, well, I was devastated. But I know what I'd heard. I responded by telling him that I had to respectfully maintain my position. It was time for me to move forward, but I wanted nothing but the best for him and the church. I didn't say, who do you think you are? We had a difference of opinion, but that wasn't going to make me dishonor him. People in positions of authority are often caught off guard sometimes when they are faced with a number eight. I've seen leaders become insecure. Writer Shelley Webb says this in an internet article. Anytime an individual becomes exalted in a position, a job, or any place of power, he or she immediately gains a new set of risks. With power comes feelings of pride and an air of confidence that can sometimes be the root of sin or other issues that may lead to sin. We should stay on guard against these types of dangers and learn from examples like David as to how to avoid those pitfalls. Yes, we should, but most of the time leaders are secure because they don't particularly care for people they cannot control. In fact, when leaders can't control the narrative, they often want to change the story. Over and over again, I've come across leaders who struggle with the big me, little king syndrome. There were a few notable exceptions, men who understood what I carried and celebrated it, but they were just that, exceptions. When I say big me, please know that I'm not making myself big in any self-aggrandizing way. I don't mean big in my own eyes. It just means that too many times when God decides to magnify what he has placed in us, People in positions of authority assume that we are their competition as opposed to an extension of their legacy. The oil will find you, and that's okay. David wasn't looking for Saul's validation as much as he desired his love and mentorship. He didn't know what being anointed really meant. There was no frame of reference for him. And there was no way for him to change his situation or status in this society. He wasn't looking for anything, but I can assure you the oil was looking for him. The significant thing about the anointing of David as king is that there were seven who went before him. And for those seven, the oil didn't flow. The oil didn't flow until he arrived. Why is this significant? Because you should know that as a number eight, you are not in competition with anyone else. Maybe if Saul understood that, he would have saved himself some trouble. It may be a church cliche, but that doesn't make it untrue. What God has for you is for you. You don't have to worry about whether someone is going to come and take your position. If that position is yours, it's yours. Until it isn't anymore, then it's theirs. You don't have any influence on that process. If you trust the Lord's planning and timing, he will get to you what belongs to you. You will have exactly what you're supposed to have. The anointing we carry is number eights. The significant, specific enablement of God for our calling is so unique that we are not in competition with anyone else. I've always been able to celebrate other people, and that's the truth. I've never been jealous of anyone else's gift. Can I encourage you not to be jealous or insecure because someone else has a different gift or what you would perceive as a more significant gift than yours? There are a diversity of gifts to build up the body of Christ, but there is no gift that is greater than another. They all complement one another. So we are not in competition with anyone. We are in concert with everyone. So let's learn how to celebrate our brothers and sisters who are walking this path of life and fighting for those who can't fight for themselves. Some people will do anything for a position. I'm not one of them. David wasn't one of them. In fact, David was just the last kid on the totem pole, forgotten about. He's the one that got the oil. And let me encourage you in this. He had seven brothers in front of him. The prophet was trying to pour the oil on all seven of them. But God said no until he showed up. And then the oil was allowed to flow. Please take heart. You don't have to jockey for a position. You don't have to fight for approval. You don't need someone else's celebration of you. You don't need someone else to fail for you to succeed. The anointing that has your name on it, the calling, the gift that has your name on it is irreversible and irrevocable. Your job is to be faithful, 
and everything with your name on it will get to you. Yes, David wasn't looking for the oil, but the oil was looking for him. Attempting to usurp authority or to use our words to harm someone else is actually beneath a number eight. We don't have to do that. Our very lives prove the miraculous nature of the development of God. Andre Van Belkum on LifeHopeAndTruth.com said this, Because of his wholehearted worship of God, David was richly blessed and became the greatest king to rule Israel. As a result of his righteous and effective leadership, the people of Israel experienced a time of national blessing and prosperity. It is clear that David was no usurper, but that it was God who placed him on the throne, a fact eventually recognized by the entire nation. You can have all the gifts in the world, but if God doesn't choose you, it doesn't matter. Likewise, if you don't have any of the skills that you think you should have, if God has ordained you for a thing, he will elevate you. I am a living witness. I am not credentialed. I don't have advanced degrees in theology, but I firmly believe that I am anointed to preach the gospel. God is using me to build bridges among cultures and denominations, not because I am so learned, but because I have submitted to the work he has given me. You can't add anything to the anointing. You can only allow the anointing to seep into you and season you. You can let it settle you. You can be gifted and grow in your knowledge, but the anointing is the supernatural enabling power of God to manifest his purpose in the earth. The anointing is reserved for those who will serve people like they literally have no time left. And as intense and as powerful as your calling is and your gift is, the power of your calling, the power of your anointing will not be in some grand display for all the world to see. The power of your anointing will be how you act once the moment of the platform is over. What did David do after he got anointed? Did he walk around with a velvet robe? Did he tilt his crown to the side and point at his brothers, screaming, In your face, suckers! No, I believe that his character had been developed even at a young age, to the point that once the anointing was done, while the oil was still fresh on his hair, he looked around and asked his dad, Can I go back outside now? With a shocked look, I believe Jesse whispered, Yes, yeah, son, sure. Knowing all this, no matter how big God says your anointing is, honor those little kings in your life. It's about honor. One of the things a number eight can do to guard against some of these challenges with a leader and against an attack from the Saul's in our lives is to go in honoring that person. Honor is the currency of elevation. I believe every leader I've served will say I honored them, their wives, their children, and their vision. I've never served at a church where I wanted to be anything other than what I was asked to be. I've never entertained the conversations I'd hear from many people who would say, you're so gifted, why don't you start your own church? I quickly shut that down because that's the spirit of Absalom. Number eight, though called themselves, do not usurp authority or try to take something that God never intended for them. So many people want to be the woman or the man, but sometimes just being one in the crowd that helps the vision is exactly where God wants you. So whether you are in ministry like me, in a professional or corporate setting, or in academia, your job is to not try to knock someone else out of position, but to maximize your position as best you can. If you make up your mind and in your heart that you're going to honor no matter what, then you truly have the heart of a number eight. And to be clear, it's not about whether the other person honors you first, or even if they ever honor you at all. Honor is about understanding God's authority and how God sets it up. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same, for he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience' sake. Romans 13, 1 through 5. So if you have a leader, then honor him or her. That leader was placed there for a reason. You can learn something even in bad circumstances. Many times when I kept seeing the same pattern, I learned what not to do as a leader. I must say that there is definitely a difference between honoring a leader and accepting abuse. I'm not saying that you should let someone treat you like a rug they wipe their feet on. It's okay to stand your ground in this regard, but you should still make the determination to honor that person. The other part of honor, particularly when a situation is bad, such as when you are faced with the big me, little king syndrome, 
is not allowing offense to overtake you. When you begin to ascend and start doing the things that your leaders may not want you to do, it is entirely possible that they may say or do things that hurt you. If you walk in a place of offense, then that offense can turn into unforgiveness, and unforgiveness can short-circuit everything the Lord wants to do in your life. John Bevere, in his best-selling book, The Bait of Satan, digs into the impact that offense can have on believers and how we might turn away from it. When those who have been placed in my life to lead me and train me betray me and turn against me, as Saul turned against David, I will follow the example of David and refuse to let hope die in my heart. Holy Spirit, empower me to be a spiritual father or mother to those who need me to disciple, love, support, and encourage them. Father, raise up spiritual leaders in our land who can lead others with justice, mercy, integrity, and love. Allow me to be one of these leaders. When I am cut off from my father, physical or spiritual, through his insecurity, jealousy, or pride, cause me to recognize that as you did with David, you want to complete your work in my life. Holy Spirit, release me from tormenting thoughts or self-blame and striving for acceptance. Cause me to seek only your acceptance and restoration. I refuse to allow the enemy to cause me to seek revenge against those who have wronged me. I will not raise my hand against the Lord's anointed or seek to avenge myself. I will leave justice to you. Father, cause my heart to be pure as David's was pure. Through your power, O Lord, I refuse to attack my enemies with my tongue, for I will never forget that both death and life are in the power of the tongue. Proverbs 18, 21. I will never seek to sow discord or separation between myself and my Christian brothers and sisters, for it is an abomination to my Lord. I will remain loyal to my spiritual leaders, even when they have rejected me or wronged me. I choose to be a man or woman after the heart of God, not one who seeks to avenge myself. Holy Spirit, like David, I will lead my Christian brother and sister to honor our spiritual leaders even in the face of betrayal. I refuse to sow discord among brethren. I will show kindness to others who are in relationship with the ones who have wronged me. Like David, I will find ways to honor them and will not allow offense to cause me to disrespect them. Father, only you are worthy to judge the intents and actions of myself or of those around me. I praise you for your wisdom, and I submit to your leading. Lord, I choose to remain loyal to those in a position of authority over me. I choose to focus on the calling you have placed on my life and to refuse to be diverted by the actions of others, even when they have treated me wrongly. Father, may you be able to examine my life and know and see that there is neither evil nor rebellion in my heart towards others. 1 Samuel 24, 11. For me, through very real relational pain, I'm going to honor my leaders. Through inevitable misunderstandings, I'm going to honor them. Because one day, I will have people under me. And I hope that the honor I've sown, I will reap. He missed his heart. As I've said, David wasn't looking to become king. God chose him. Saul was still king when David became the talk of a nation. Surely Saul was grateful for David and the death of Goliath, but the insecure place in Saul manifested, of all places, after a song. As the king and his army were returning from battle, the ladies of the city were singing. Whatever Saul asked David to do, David did it successfully. So Saul made him a commander over the men of war, an appointment that was welcomed by the people and Saul's officers alike. When the victorious Israelite army was returning home after David had killed the Philistine, women from all the towns of Israel came out to meet King Saul. They sang and danced for joy with tambourines and cymbals. This was their song. Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. This made Saul very angry. What's this, he said. They credit David with ten thousands and me with only thousands. Next, they'll be making him their king. 1 Samuel 18 verses 5 through 9. Well, yeah. Obviously, Saul didn't like the song. <laughs> In fact, he hated the song, and he came to hate the one the song honored, so much so that he tried to kill him. Saul tried to kill David, not because he thought David wanted what he had. He wanted to kill him because he knew he didn't have what David carried. There are some people who have plenty of position, money, authority, and notoriety but they just can't seem to reconcile why they want to be you as opposed to the other way around. I've never wanted to be anybody other than who God made me. Once I came into an awareness of what God had for my life, I didn't want to be anybody else, and I was content to play the position that I was created to occupy. Oh, if Saul could have only seen the same in the heart of David. David wanted no part of a monarchy. He just wanted to be loved. He wanted his king to be proud of him. David just wanted to be accepted. He couldn't help that he was great. 
but the small mindset and limited vision of King Saul caused him to miss the beauty of having a relationship with the best son he could have ever wanted. The Nature of Sonship What was really interesting about the pastor I mentioned at the beginning of this chapter was that over the years, as God continued to elevate me, that individual, who is a great leader in the body of Christ, welcomed me back, called me son, and that was true. He was still my spiritual father and I his spiritual son. All I could say is, look at God. We didn't agree, and there was certainly pain. But when there is sonship, the relationship dynamics don't change just because fears and trouble enter in. This is why I said that we cannot allow offense to infect our hearts. There is always the possibility of reconciliation. The Bible says God has given us the ministry of reconciliation, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. That's not only just spiritually where we are the vessels God uses to reconcile lost souls to their creator, but that's also about reconciling ourselves to one another as the body of Christ. Whether in the church or on the job, pretty much in every area of your life, you will see yourself on the fast track to relevance and longevity if you have cultivated a culture of honor where reconciliation after conflict is possible. But I must add this important point. All too often, Number eights find themselves overachieving to honor those we revere and respect. Don't do that. Sometimes those who are leaders over us will assume the motive is not the need for acceptance, but pure ambition. Also, we could find ourselves exchanging the word God has given us for the word of a man or woman and missing our purpose altogether. When this pastor told me that I shouldn't go, I could have easily submitted to that voice because he was a father figure and I loved him, despite the fact that his voice was diametrically opposed to the voice of God I heard that would not have pleased God at all. Sometimes wanting to be accepted will cause you to miss God's blessing. As a number eight, you're going to take the path less traveled. You have got to be willing to say, yes, Lord, I heard your voice and I'm going to trust you. This is where your faith is groomed. You will be developed in a whole different way. That desire to be accepted and celebrated could have derailed me from my destiny. I would have been stuck in a very nice church with really good people serving an excellent vision, but that would not have been the sum total of what I was called to fulfill. So the relational implications of this idea of sonship and daughters too, particularly in the church, are important. I've seen a lot of spiritual fathers and spiritual sons, and unfortunately, I've also seen some of those relationship dynamics manipulated, particularly when it comes to men and women like me who don't have access to our earthly fathers. Spiritual leaders have a real responsibility to operate with honor, integrity, and character when stewarding individuals and navigating this area of sonship so that people are not injured further because they believed in a man. I've actually heard people say, if you're my spiritual son, then you need to give me X number of dollars. I don't believe that's what sonship is, at all. I'm not asking the people I mentor and spend time with for a nickel, especially when what God gave me, he gave for free. If someone wants to give a blessing to me and my wife, then that's fine, but I don't ask people for anything. I believe that if you're a leader, God takes care of you. You don't have to manipulate people's emotions to get that provision. I don't believe that the blessing of God is coming to a person because they gave a certain amount of money to an individual. Don't get me wrong. I am a tither. I believe in the principle of sowing into people, but I'm talking about leaders who manipulate relationships for personal gain. Here's the thing. No child gets to choose their parents. A child arrives here through us and they get what they get. They are our progeny, whether they like it or not. But when it comes to sonship, Nobody is forcing you to be or have a spiritual parent. Even when Jesus said, very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. John 6, 53. Many people departed that very day. Jesus turned to his 12 disciples and said, will you bounce too?" my interpretation, of course. They said, where are we going to go? You have the words of life. But I don't think Jesus would have been mad if they did. He just wanted to know. He certainly didn't say, yo, if you leave, you won't be blessed. The truth is, many of the most value-adding relationships in our lives are voluntary. I don't love my wife because I have to love her. I love her because I choose to love her. I volunteer my love daily to my wife. Every spiritual relationship should be voluntary in nature. If you are at a church where you feel like you are not being fed, take your family where you will be. Now, if you have been offended and it is biblical truth making you want to leave, then search your heart to make sure it's not just you being unwilling to face the reality of changing your life. Know the differences between offense, bad teaching, and spiritual manipulation. Sonship is rooted in a voluntary